We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, Life expectancy varies by 30 years, depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white, life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison. The United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Hello, my name is Michael Jacoby Brown, and I'm your host for We Hold These Truths. And today we're very lucky to have George Luce, an organizer for many, many years with the Massachusetts Teachers Association and other organizers, other organizations as our host. George, welcome to We Hold These Truths. It's nice to see you. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I'm really glad you're here. Uh, George, can you tell us a little bit about your early life, your background, and where you got your values from? Well, just let me say quickly, uh, I, I had not seen the introductory uh, video before, and I'm humbled to be uh, counted as a person who is uh, help, helping with his life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Uh, that, that, that's that been my life's goal, and I'm really honored and humbled that you asked me to do this, Michael. So thank you. Uh, We're honored to have you, George. Um, so uh, ask the question again. I'm sorry. The, well, just tell us a little bit about your early life and where, well, you, where you grew up and where you got your values for pursuing justice. My, uh, I mean, uh, the more, the, the older I get, the more I understand that my, my life story really starts with the life story of my parents, who were both born in, in Mississippi. My, <laughs> my father was a, a, a city boy born in Yazoo City, Mississippi, where my mother was a bit more rural, uh, born in Duck Hill, Mississippi. And uh, uh, I was raised, I was raised in, raised in Detroit, uh, uh, like many uh, uh, African-American families. My parents migrated around World War II when my father was stationed uh, outside of Detroit, Selfridge Air Force Base. My mother came up to work in the, in the post office. Um, and uh, I, they, they, the, the, I, I, my values, my values come from them. And, um, and, and the more I sort of unpack my life, I understand that they were traumatized by living in early, you know, in Mississippi in the early part of the uh, 20th century. Um, uh, my mother witnessed lynch lynchings that sort of uh, impacted her life. My father, um, you know, uh, was uh, ashamed of the fact I didn't really understand my lineage, only to find out at the age of 30 or so that my great grandfather was a white man who, you know, for one or better, I don't know what was happening in Mississippi, but I gotta, I gotta assume that he raped my great grandmother, and that sort of, you know, set my, uh, set their their training for me. That is, uh, you know, you gotta be twice as good as white people to to get to get anywhere, which said to me I was twice as inferior as black people, which which made me strive, you know, which made me determined to be successful, but always with this uh, internalized racism monkey on my back. Um, uh, but uh, they taught me to persevere. They taught me to um, uh, not rock the boat, but to keep moving on. I mean, I remember several times calling uh, in several situations when, as I got older, uh, 
um, and felt like a soldier in a war that I was not prepared for, uh, uh, calling my mother in tears, uh, telling her to uh, let me come home. Don't make me stay in this place with all these white people. Like, but she said, uh, you gotta, you gotta, you know, keep your head down, but you gotta persevere. You know, we're counting on you in so many, in, in so many ways. So that, that colored, that colored the way I saw the world. And, um, and it, you know, it had, it has, it had its uh, positive impact and it had its negative impact. Um, so I, so that, that's, that's sort of my early training, my early view, uh, where my early values came from. And my, also my parents, especially my, my mother was very religious and there was a, there was a, uh, there's a, a Christian ethic of service that I got from her. I, um, I, I questioned the Christian part of it uh, and still do, but the service part of it, um, I got it. And also, you know, she was very, we lived in an all black neighborhood. Uh, actually, we, we sort of, the, the, we were the way from Eastern European Catholic folks who were, were running for the suburbs as we were moving in but there were still uh, poor white people. And my mother in her Christian service always sought them out, always strove to make them feel part of the neighborhood. It was, uh, it was a complicated, but um, you know, I, um, I feel the emotion coming up, but it was a very full, very rich uh, 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 set of values um, that, that, I, that I gained from my parents. And where did you move on? You said you were uh, raised in Detroit. Where did you move after that? And how did you get involved in organizing? Um, I, uh, I, came, I, came, uh, I, uh, I came of age, so to speak, uh, around the time that affir affirmative action was happening. I think I graduated from high school in 1965. Uh, I spent a year. I was a, preco I was a precocious young musician at that time. So I, I uh, right after high school, I spent a year at this uh, music academy in northern Michigan, the Interlochen, Interlochen Arts Academy. Famous, yeah. Oh, you've heard of it. Yeah. That's, oh, it's famous. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, preco precocious young trumpet player I was, oh. which led to a scholarship at the University of Michigan, um, and uh, which led to teaching uh, teaching music in uh, in Inkster, Michigan, and then uh, now this was the '60s, so I, I made a jump and moved to uh, to Maine um, as part of the uh, you know as part of my my uh, trying to figure out who I was. I, I I made I became part of the Back to Land movement. Moved to Maine, uh, taught music in Maine for uh, I don't know five years or so. But then uh, got involved in the union, and um, you know, um, uh, I, I was uh, on the local bargaining team in Belfast, Maine, and uh, from there I got a job with the um, Maine. It was then the Maine Teachers Association. Now it's the Maine Education Association. The executive director there uh, was new to the state and needed to check the box saying that. My staff is diverse, and uh, <laughs> and in Maine, there weren't many, you know, there weren't many African American folks. Uh, right. So I I got the job knowing absolutely nothing about negotiations, about union work. I mean, my father was a teamster, lifelong teamster, and I did really? spend time with him uh, on the picket line, and uh, I used to go to work with him, uh, and uh, I, I I didn't learn. Uh, union values, but my mother always berated my father for teaching me curse words uh, from the, <laughs> the union guys. But um, uh, so I went to work for the Maine Education Association and uh, I was lucky enough, you know, once again, uh, the NEA at this point needed also to check its boxes and they were starting an organizing, uh, organizing academy, the NEA, they're the um, the the uh, mo mostly men, uh, white men, who in the early '60s would 
parachute into a state with three or four names, and six months later there would be uh, there would be a a, 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 a a union a teachers union who was uh, 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 soliciting uh, legislation uh, for collective bargaining uh, rights. Uh, the, these were the guys, and I got and I got selected to be part of this national training cohort, um, uh, and uh, and that's and that's where I learned. That's where I really learned about organizing. Um, the um, uh, what was the name of the book that was sort of the central text? In dubious battle, Steinbeck. Uh, was oh, right. Right, uh, uh, organizing in the uh, apple orchards in uh, Northern California, and just the whole idea of um, of uh, the whole idea of, of collective power sort of crystallized in my mind, and all of these uh, all of these uh, conflicts that I was having in my head around racism, around my identity, around my place, sort of clicked and. And somewhere during that period, I, um, I, the, my my life's work uh, came came into view for me, and that and I in my the twenty eight year old na na naivete, um, I, I I knew that I could um, uh, have a, a have a serious impact on racism. As a matter of fact, at one point I actually thought I could eradicate racism, uh, just to show how naive I was. Uh, in my lifetime, with this powerful tool uh, of organizing, uh, you know, and I remember that first definition: people coming together to create power to accomplish mutual self-interest gains. It just clicked, and I be and I became part of this um, national cohort, and and learned as I learned as I, learned organizing as I went along, and right. um, and. Uh, that, that's how I, I fell into it and became sort of uh, um, lacking any uh, lacking the uh, aggression uh, bargaining aggression that I saw in my white counterparts. That's just not me. Um, uh, you know, keep your head down. Uh, don't cause waves. I was much more subtle in my uh, way I went about doing things. Uh, but my organizing skills, my organizing uh, reputation sort of grew, and um, uh, even though I'm, I was still learning, and I'm still learning. I found my niche in um, in, in working for uh, NEA and its and its affiliates, which served me well as I entered into all always mostly. In fact, in Maine, it was all white staff except for me. When I got to Massachusetts, it was practically all white staff except for me. Um, but my ability, my vision around organizing helped me, helped stabilize me through some pretty rough periods, especially when I first came to Massachusetts, where it was clear that I was not wanted by the, not by the N MTA, because once again, they needed to check, check that box. But still checking boxes. That's still a lot of what goes on, as and, I'm sure um, you know. And, and I'm trying not to swear as we move along here. But uh, that's all right. We're on television. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but can you tell me a little bit what those? Uh, you said you weren't really uh, wanted by the Mass Teachers Association, and this was what thirty, almost thirty years ago. Or I came uh, to the Mass Teachers Association in nineteen. I think it was nineteen eighty-eight. Wow. That um, was more than thirty years ago. And uh, what was it like then? Well, uh, first of all, the reason, the really, the the, re the the people that got me here were these five or six uh, uh, black female, mostly uh, members, who were part of the. They had the. There was a minority affairs committee, and these women knew something about organizing, and they. You know, they they organize their allies and uh, convince the MTA that they needed to diversify the staff. Uh, and uh, once again, Northeast was pretty. Uh, there was pretty uh, not many staff people of color. I think there was right. me, me and Dimple Armstrong in Connecticut. Uh, so I was in Maine, and um, uh, and the 
And one of my mentors from the NEA, a black guy named Garfield Bright, told me I should apply. He's told me two things. He should said I should. There's this job in Massachusetts you should apply for. And then he said, "But you're crazy to go there. Those folks are racist. They don't want you." But you know, I was I was needing to get out of Maine at that point. I uh, am yeah. at at heart a city boy, and um, and so the and came interviewed for the job. Met these. Uh, five women, and there was one. Uh, there was one brother also, um, and uh, I got hired. And the uh, I walk into my uh, supervisor's office, and this was, I think, the last presidential election. Jesse Jackson was a uh, was a uh, uh, a candidate. Uh, I'm proud to say I was a, I was a uh, I was um, a delegate for Jesse in Maine. I didn't go to the national, but. Um, but on the on the on his uh, uh, cork board there, there were the, there were cartoons after cartoons disparaging horrible racists uh, about um, about Jesse. So I uh, I knew that I was you know I I, I was going to have some rough roads, but you know my mother is in my ear saying you got to persevere. You know we're depending on you. Keep your head down, stay safe, but get in there and do something. Um, so at the end of my first year, he wouldn't give me, uh, he wouldn't give me, uh, you know, you get a year's um, probation. He refused to give me professional status. And these same five African-American women uh, came to my rescue and uh, demanded, I don't know, you remember Ed Sullivan, who was the um, director. I do. They, they, yeah. they lit up his behind and said, you, you make it, you, you give this man the, the, uh, what he needs to be successful or else. And um, he moved me out of the analysis. I had a new, and they treated me like I was like the, the in the new office, he must've given them the riot, you know, the riot act too, because they treated me like I was the long lost son. Of course, that didn't, that didn't last forever either. And I got into conflict there. So, um, and I learned early on from these black women that I needed to establish a power base. And luckily I knew how to organize and and that power base uh, um, uh, supported me. It's people that I met and worked with in my early years were my support uh, throughout my career uh, at MTA. And who were some of those people? I don't know if you remember the names of the five black women and the one black guy you mentioned. This was a long time ago, I know. Well, Josephine Bernard, Edith Cannon, oh, and the Louise Gaskins. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's uh, Ann Wass, who was a white woman who was a, a, a powerful ally. Um, those are the names. Those are the names. I Great. Remember. And they were all teachers in various teachers. districts, I assume. Yep. Right? Yep. Yeah. And, uh, Randolph, and I'm not sure. Uh, Ann was someplace in southeast uh, southeast Michigan. Uh, um, Louise Gaskins was from Bedford up that way so you were there for a long time and or uh, i know we've uh and uh when, when you think about uh your years there what are some of the lessons that you say uh you learned there as an organizer what are some of the most important things or i don't know if you have one short story to tell that sort of explains oh uh, well yeah, I, I, I also had the opportunity to take the uh so, so NEA training is okay, but NEA is NEA, right? They're they're still checking boxes, as you said. Even though things, they, uh, they, I see some, there's some light at the end of the tunnel. But you know, as an organizer, you always see the light at the end of the tunnel, no matter how right. bad it's Because as long as we can organize, we get a chance, right? right. So, um, and I I felt uh, and, and I met another mentor, Ernesto Cortez. Uh, oh yeah, right. Uh, I know him. Yeah. The IAF, and um, I learned two things. Uh, two things from him. One, one I sort of knew, and that is the one-on-one -on -one is the revolution, revolutionary tool of organizing, is what he said. But, yeah. but he also said, and this has helped me understand that you have to keep learning. Is that to be a good organizer, you have to be willing to be transformed, right? You can never you 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 have to enter every situation with utmost humility, and uh, be ready to understand that you don't know everything, 
that there are stories out there you've never heard, uh, and that your job your job depends on your willingness to be transformed. So that I mean, we were just uh, you know we we were, we were talking to Katie earlier before the broadcast, and here's another opportunity for me. I have to be willing to be transformed as we see our Asian brothers and sisters gaining awareness as to, you know, their place in America. So here's another, here's another, and out of tragedy comes opportunity, right? Here's another opportunity. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, yes, for us to pull together, and it depends on organizers like you and I and others to be to be our willingness to be transformed, to always be questioning our, our biases, our values, not our values, but you know, always questioning what we think we know about the world as it currently is, because it's always, always, always changing, changing, especially as we unpack this this racism thing, right? Um, there's there's plenty of stuff to, to learn. Always something. And and what would you say as you know, we're uh, at a place, both of us in our lives, where we're trying to train younger people. And I know you're particularly interested in training young black people as organizers. What are the, some of the things you'd like them to understand and know? I think that, uh, I mean, I the I come back to the willingness to be transformed to, uh, I mean, it's up to we elders, seniors, to um, to use our skills to hook them, you know, to go out and meet 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 these young uh, uh, young men and women of color, um, and uh, meet them where they are, and you know, uh, the as Ernesto Cortez says, the one on one is a revolutionary tool of organizing. Get out there and do one on ones if it be on the street corners. In the church, wherever we can find young people at the YMCA, I don't know where, but they're, they're, um, they have energy, they have rage, and uh, I think it's up to us to find a way to, um, to channel that way, rage. I mean, the, another uh, working, with, when I was working with Wellst uh, Wellst people from Wellstone, um, yeah. up northern Minnesota Presbyterian organizer used to say, there's a place in the choir for all God's children. Yeah. So, you know, we got to bring, we got to bring these young people of color, these young black African-Americans, Latinx, Asian, we got to bring them into the fold and find, find their, help them find their place in the choir to, um, to, to, um, so that they, so they'll understand their, their, I, I said that I felt like I was in a war that that I was ill prepared to fight as a young person myself back in the '60s. Well, uh, these are different times, and we have to help them understand that they have a place. They have a place in this army, and um, we we can help them channel that rage, that uh, resentment. Uh, well, all all understandable uh, in in a positive direction. And when you say you have, sorry, you were going to say something? No, 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 go, go on. Now, when you say you have to be transformed, can you say a little bit about what that might actually mean uh, for someone in their work, in their life on a daily basis, what that looks like, what it looked like for you, perhaps? Um, for me, it looked like, it looked like being willing to be um, radically self-aware, radically self-critical, um, to question, you know, I, you know, I, uh, in internal, I internalize a lot of racism, you know, as we all do. Um, and, you know, and 400 years worth of it, I got it from my parents, as I explained, they got it from their parents, God bless them. Um, uh, so, um, I sort of lost my train here, but... Um, oh, and, and you said when you came, certainly to Maine, certainly to Massachusetts, there was plenty of even very overt racism, those Jesse Jackson cartoons. Why is it so important now that uh, young Black people become organizers and learn that work of 
doing the one-on-ones, learning how to build power. Why is that so important now, George? Because uh, the most I see most of these uh, entry-level organizing jobs going to young white <clears throat> college graduates, <clears throat> and they don't um, they don't have the lived experience of um, of racism. The, they don't have the lived experience of the impact of racism on on oppressed people. Um, so, so we need black people, African Americans, Caribbean Americans, all people who have suffered under um, colonialism, racism, to be in, at the table in those strategy sessions. For, so when you know the the uh, the conversation seems to be going in the radically wrong way, we can speak up. We've been trained. We understand organizing, and let me tell you that that's going to fail. Here's what you got to think about. Here's what we need to think about. Those voices are not currently are, are missing from from uh, from the table when it comes to organizing strategy, organizing campaigns, choosing what you're going to organize around. And, and what are some of your plans in the next uh, <clears throat> days, months, years to actually do that, George? What are you hoping to do? And um, to, uh, to have conversations with uh, you and Horace Small and Edwin Argueta and other uh, senior organizers about how we can pull together the resources to, uh, to, uh, to develop, to establish an academy for um, uh, you know, black organizers, young black organizers. You know, the organizers who probably won't have the opportunity to go to college, but have plenty of life experiences which are uh, invaluable, more valuable than going to uh, uh, a college where, you know, the the, the myth of um, we're in a post-racial society or whatever is fed, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I know what you're talking about. And, and what would you say to them if you were talking now to some young black person who was thinking of you know, getting into organizing, what would be like some of the words you would say to them? Um, well, I would start out with, um, uh, you know, how's it going for you? Where are you? That's where I I, I would, I, what I have to say, it's your, your, it's your time, you know, it's, it's our time, uh, but I don't have anything to say until I listen first, and then it will be, to support uh, starting where you are, to give you, uh, what are your dreams, you know, given where you are, what are your dreams and how can uh, how can we put together an organization that will help you realize your dreams? I mean, that's, that's uh, I would, I just have to enter the, uh, enter the conversation as a humble, humbled and ready to listen and 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 say whatever I have to say as a response to where you are. So you're teaching well, and, and by doing. Is it, will it be willing to be transformed? You can be transformed. I mean that would uh, that, that's that for me is you you always have to keep learning to be in a good organizing. You have to be willing to learn all the time about yourself, about other people, around uh, different uh, situations. You just have to have a. I have to have a brain that's open to everything. Well, thanks a lot, George. Our time's almost up. I know it went quickly, but if there's one last word you want to say to uh, people who are thinking about getting into the organizing business, what would that be? Anything else? Um, Michael, I think I, I said it all. Okay. Now, George Luce, George, who spends a lifetime organizing uh, with the teachers union, first in Maine, Later in Massachusetts, you were certainly the only black organizer much of that time, uh, fought that battle, and we're looking forward to having you uh, teach many others and listen to many others. I'll just and say that I haven't spent a lifetime organizing yet, but I plan to. <laughs> right. You still got quite a lot of time left. Well, thank you. My name again is Michael Jacoby Brown. I'm your host at We Hold These Truths. We were very honored to have today George Luce, an organizer for decades with the Massachusetts Teachers Union and still organizing, especially young black people who can take the work that George and others have done into the future. So George Luce, George Luce, thank you very much. It's an honor to have you on our show. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.